everybody, welcome to Crafting and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Rebecca, and today you're going to hear part four of the Belangelo murders. They, this is the Belangelo Forest in Australia, where seven backpackers go missing and their bodies are discovered in this forest. The backpackers, five of those backpackers were foreign individuals and two were from Australia. It was James Gibson and Deborah Everest, they were a couple that went missing and were later found. Simone Schmidl, she had set out by herself to go to Melbourne to meet her mom, who's coming in for a visit. She disappeared. Gabor Nugabauer and Anya Habshi, they were a couple who went missing. And finally, Joanne Walters and Caroline Clark, a couple from the UK that went missing. So all those bodies have been discovered. The police are now forming Task Force Air, and they are zeroing in after a tip from a man named Paul Onions that I describe in episode three, who calls in and lets them know about an incident that happened to him at the entrance to the Belangelo State Forest. He had been offered a ride by a guy named Bill in a four-wheel drive vehicle that Paul was later able to describe in, in some detail, and he was able to give a description of this individual. So they were very, very interested in this because Ivan Malat, his name kept coming up on the tips. He, some One tip, uh, a woman called in and she said, you know, you need to look at this Malat family. They have a lot of property uh, right off the Hume Highway in Blangelo Forest. They know it very, very well, and they're avid collectors of weapons. So they had their eye on this family. And Ivan Malat happened to match the description given by Paul Onion. So in the last episode, I was I talked to you all about the Malat family, uh, the 14 kids. Ivan was the fifth of, of the birth order of these children, and he was the smartest, the strongest, and sort of like their pack leader. When they wanted to commit a crime, he did all the planning. Now, they he, he had recently done a bank robbery that he got away with, so the police were focused on him early on because of this bank robbery. So when we left off, Ivan had just witnessed the death of his sister, Margaret, when William, who was driving a vehicle, with Margaret as a passenger, gets into a head-on collision. Margaret passes away. Ivan was really, really close to Margaret. Now, at this time, Ivan knew he was being surveilled by the police for this bank robbery, so he moves in with his mother to help out because his father had bowel cancer. So now Ivan's the main breadwinner in this family. However, and he spent the next three years supporting his family. His father passes away in 1983, and following that, Ivan decides, well, he's no longer needed to support the family because there was life insurance on his father that now would support the farm and take care of his mom. So he said, no, you know, it's time for me to settle down. I'm in my 30s. I think I'm going to take a wife, and I want to be, I want to have a family. So he, you know, police are like, has he changed? Is this, you know... He's not doing it crimes anymore, and he's settling down. So he goes to live with his cousins, and he meets a woman or a girl named Karen. Now, Karen is only 16 years old, and she's pregnant. She, Her boyfriend was one of his cousins. So he spent a lot of time with Karen. You know, she was off limits because this is his brother or his cousin's girlfriend. But however, you know, the more time they spent together, they started to fall in love. So Ivan, they finally consummate the relationship. She tells her cousin, hey, I'm breaking up with you. <laughs> the family is like distraught. You know, Ivan, how could you do this? But then when they sat back and they thought about it, wait a minute, Ivan's older. This cousin, he, he's got no prospects. He's a teenager too. Uh, you know, Karen would have lived a life of poverty with a cousin, but now she's going to be taken care of by Ivan. So Ivan sets up, he buys a home trailer. Uh, he buys a trailer 
they get married and they start a family with the child she was already pregnant with, the cousin's child. Ivan adopts that little boy. His name was Jason. So their relationship kind of evolves over time. Karen, you know, she's getting older and she's confronting him more. She's re realizing her power, you know, that she can say no and that there won't always be consequences. And, and sometimes he would listen to her. There was, you know, he started collecting these guns. He was very uh, adamant with her that she not spend any money, but he would go out and buy all these guns and then leave them laying all over the house. And she said, listen, you know, you got to put these guns somewhere that the, you know, Jason doesn't have access to them. So he buys a gun cabinet. So now she's realizing, you know, I need to speak up more. Uh, you know, he's good. He listens to me. Well, <laughs> this resulted in him hitting her and it, that evolved over time to where he was beating her. So he comes home one day and Karen's mother came to get her and take, they take everything, all the furniture, all the belongings out of the trailer. Only thing they left the guns. They're gone. They take everything. So poor Ivan, he sets up lawn chairs in, in his trailer living room and he's like, okay, they're gone. They, they proceed to try to get a divorce. And in the divorce, he had to pay her, of course, money every month for child support and alimony. Well, he decided I'm not going to work. You know, a lot of men used to try that. So he became essentially unemployed and he would work in different places, but he would use his brother's name, William, and he called himself Bill. He used his brother's uh, documents and he got jobs under his brother's name. Remember I said a lot of these kids looked alike these, these, and as adults they did too, so he got away with it. So that way she didn't get any money because they would garnish your wages uh, if you didn't pay voluntarily. Now, fast forward to after these murders happen. Like I said, they had their eye on Ivan Millat. So they look into his background. They do a background check and there's stuff there, but it doesn't really fit their profile that they've got of who this murderer could be. But then they said, you know, their database only went back to 1984. Prior to that, they would have to do a manual background check. So they do this manual background check and they find out that in 1971, Ivan picked up and abducted two women near the Belangelo State Forest. Now, these were young women. They were backpacking their way to Melbourne. He picks them up. One of them takes a Valium and she falls asleep in the back seat. The other one was in the front seat and eventually she falls asleep as well. So when they wake up, the vehicle is stopped there in the forest. They're like, what's going on? And he's like, um, you're going to have sex with me. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you. So he proceeds to bind both of them, cut off their clothing beneath the binders, so he does have sex with one of them in the vehicle while the other one is bound. Then he, when he's done with her, he's like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not so keen on having sex with the other one. He, you know, he's finished. Uh, so he says, you know, I'm going to buy you guys a drink. So he takes the girls to this convenience store and he gets out to go buy them a drink. And when he does, they get out because now they're unbound and they're tr they put on what they could of their clothes that were you know piecemeal and they go and they hide in the forest and then they later report this to police so back in the 70s they police because the girls were able to identify the vehicle and the police were on to the malats so they arrest ivan for these rapes and the girls identify him and they're like yeah that's him so he hires an attorney and the attorney tells him uh, you know, he, he's given bail and the attorney tells him during one of the proceedings, listen, you know, you could get up to 18 years in jail for this. So Ivan says, okay, you know, I, I need to run an errand. I'll be right back. So, or he was going to go have a cigarette. I'll be right back. He never comes back. He leaves. He goes to live in New Zealand, another country, but it didn't require that you have a passport to get into that country from Australia. So he goes over and lives in New Zealand. However, when he comes back, the police are waiting for him over a year later. 
They arrest him for the bank robbery and they arrest him for the rapes. Now, unfortunately, you know, years have passed. He goes on trial. He hires the same lawyer. He goes on trial for the bank robbery and none of the witnesses are available and the jury finds him not guilty. So the next day commences the trial. It was this time he didn't have bail, I might add. <laughs> so the next day he goes on trial for the rapes or he was scheduled to go on trial for the rapes. That night, his attorney goes to this bar and sees the two women that were alleging that he raped them. He sees them and they're holding hands. Well, the attorney, he's gay and he recognizes gay when he sees it. And he, back, we're talking 70s, like this did not go over well with jurors if you were having a relationship with another person of the same sex. So the next day, he confronts her on one of the girls on the witness stand and she breaks down and she says, yes, I'm in a relationship with the other girl. And, and he's like, you, and he just had her so flustered that he got her to admit, oh, you wanted to have sex with him. And she's like, oh yes, you know? And so anyway, the jury finds him not guilty. So meanwhile, fast forward, the police, they're doing a manual search of the records before 1984 and they find this rape and kidnapping. They're like, oh my God, this is exactly like the seven victims in our case. So now they're really focused on Ivan, but they don't believe that they have enough to arrest him. So during their investigation, they go and they pull all of Ivan's work records. And each time one of these backpack murders is committed or the, the people go missing, Ivan is not working that day and has no alibi for where he was on that day. That coupled with the fact that he had the same vehicle at the time of the disappearances and he had this mustache that Paul Onions is describing. So they fly Paul Onions back to Australia to do a lineup with him, a video lineup, in which he identifies Ivan Milat. He says that he's the one. That, yep, he's your guy. So they decided, we're going to plan a raid on Ivan Vlad's home. And we're going to, because they, they got a search warrant for his house. So they run a raid at the house and search his property. So the way they do this is they surround his property. And the lead detective calls Ivan and says, wakes him up. He's in bed with his girlfriend. And he wakes him up and he says, you know, this is the police. You're surrounded. You need to come out with your hands up, you know, that kind of thing. And P Ivan thinks that he's being, that the whole thing is a joke. It's a prank being pulled on him by his coworkers. So he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be out in five minutes. Well, he doesn't come out in five minutes. So a second phone call is made by the lead detective. You know, how come you're not following our instructions? And he's like, come on, man, you know, the, the, the gig is up. It's, it's. I, I'm not, I'm really not going along with this joke, you know, and they're like, no, we are the police. Just come outside, take a left at the fence and then put your, you know, put your lay flat on the ground. He's like, oh, okay, let me get my pants on. So they wait and they wait and they wait, doesn't come out. So they call a third time and the girlfriend answers and she says like, yeah, he's just looking for his car keys. So now they're hearing something going on in the garage. So they all move in and they take Ivan lot into custody you know he they put handcuffs on him and have him sit down while they conduct a very thorough search of his property so they're asking him where's your guns he's like i don't i don't own any guns but they're finding cartridge cases and bullets all over this house and he's still denying i don't have any guns what they do find are cups camping cups in the pantry that are identical to the ones Shimon Schmidl had in her backpack. They also find her sleeping bag in one of the rooms. When they searched the garage, they found more camping equipment. There was a striped green pillowcase that had some cords in it and it had a blood stain. That blood stain was later identified you know, DNA was run and it was a later identified to be a match to Caroline Clark. Now, 
in the ceiling tiles, like, because I'm telling you, this was really thorough. They go up into the ceiling tiles and then in the space of the ceiling, they find something. And it turns out to be parts to a Ruger rifle. Now, one of the rifles that they were, they were looking for a 22 and a Ruger. Well, a Ruger, 22, two different rifles. Anyway, so there's Ruger parts up there. And he's still denying, I don't know, I don't know any guns. So they say, you know, you're under arrest for the murder of the seven backpackers. So Ivan, they take him down to the police station. They try to interview him. He's denying everything. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't have anything to do with any of these murders. So he calls his attorney, John Marsden, the guy that represented him for the bank robbery and the rapes and got him off. He calls him and he comes down and says, all right, you need to not talk. Don't say anything else. Meanwhile, they get a search warrant for his brother's properties. Um, they interview his brother, Alex, and Alex's wife. And they say, you know, they let him know, here's what we're here for. Um, you know, often, and they tell him, oftentimes people, when they commit these murders, they collect souvenirs. And Alex's wife says, you mean like a backpack? And they're like, yeah. She goes and gets a backpack. That's identical to Shimon Schmidl's backpack. And they said, where did you get this? And he, she said, oh, Ivan gave that to me. And on the bottom were the initials I am Ivan Milat. So later on during the investigation, they have a criminologist put it under a microscope to see if anything was scraped off or tried to erase on the bottom of his backpack. And they find Simi. This was Simone Schmidl's backpack. So next they go to Walter's house. And they find a paintball gun that belonged to Ivan and lots and lots of weapons. Uh, 22 firearms, including uh, 22s that they were looking for. So they also find two machetes, two bayonets, and a smaller backpack. Because when Simone Schmidl went missing, she had two backpacks. The larger one they found over at Alex's house. The smaller one now they're finding at Walter's house. Then they go to Richard Malat's house and execute a search warrant. And they find more camping equipment, um, including a tent that was given to Joanne Walters and Caroline Clark. During, during their expedition of Australia, they were, they had a third traveling companion who at one point said, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm going back home. You can have my tent. It has a hole in it, but it's larger than the ones you guys have. And they're like, no, no, we, we want the one you have. And lo and behold, this is the tent. It has a hole in it. It matches the description of the tent that they were carrying. Then they do a sec, they do a search warrant at his mother, Margaret's house. Now she's in her eighties. She's still alive. She's Thriving, but uh, they find a shirt that matches one that Simone Schmidl had in her backpack, and they find another shirt that Paul Onions had in his backpack. Now, remember when he encounters Ivan Milat or Bill, you know, he escapes and leaves his backpack in the back seat of Ivan's car. They also find more fire firearms at mom's house, Margaret. So they do more criminology testing and they find out that some of the rifles that they retrieved at various locations do match the shell casings and cartridges found at the murder scenes. So based on all of this evidence that they have gathered, he's been charged now with the seven murders of the backpackers and he's going to go on trial because he's maintaining his innocence. I am not guilty. Now the police... They're still not sure. Is this one guy or is this multiple guys? They don't know. They had one witness come forward to say that he had spent the night on the couch at one of the Malat brothers' homes and he had fallen asleep and was woken in the middle of the night by Ivan and Richard who had just come home and they were covered in blood and they had weapons and, uh, but later on, he retracted that story. So they weren't able to use him as a witness at the trial. So that is where we're going to leave off today. On Monday, I will do the conclusion to the Belangelo Forest murders. Yeah, 
there is a conclusion, but you, and you're not going to want to miss it because Ivan goes on trial. I'll tell you what the result of the trial is. And I've got a little update that you are not going to believe because this case just keeps on giving. So I didn't, before we go though, I do want to show you what I finished this week because this is crafting and crime. So let me show you. I have a second diamond painting that I am starting today. I'm going to be working on two at the same time. The second one is called Firebird Panorama by Ciro Marchetti. He's the artist, oh, my favorite artist. But the one I worked on all week long was a hill and it's very big. So I wanted to show you what I got done on this. It's called the Crazy Cat Lady. And there are 29 cats in this painting. They're hidden. So what I decided I would do is enhance the cat's eyes with green glow in the dark. So you can pick out where the cats are when the painting is finished. Now this is the top part of the painting. I haven't gotten there yet, but I'll show you where I am. Let me roll it down. I've got the whole bottom row done. This is my artwork. It is on release papers. It is the Crafting Journey collection sold by Crafts with Crashly. And I do have four new prints that went up for sale last week. So check those out. The link is down in the description. All right, there, look, the whole first row. So this is the rug. Here's her foot. Here's the newspaper. I enhanced the newspaper. And here's one of the kitties. There's another kitty in here, right here. So here's the first one. Here is the second one. I don't know if you can see the eyes. The green glow in the dark in the eyes. Where's the other kitty? Wait a minute. No, here's the other kitty right here. Right there and right there. The first two of the 29 kitties. So we're going to put this away and we'll get this back out next week. So have a great day, everybody. Have a good weekend. And I'll see you in episode five of the Belangolo Forest Murders. Bye, everybody.